Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another live stream draw along. My name is Kat Huang. I am a teaching artist here at Art Prof, and I'm joined today by fellow teaching artist Jordan McCracken Foster. Today, we are doing lighting for characters. If you want to nerd out about art, Art Prof has everything you need from tutorials to critiques to a community of fellow art nerds. So Jordan, do you want to start us off by explaining what kinds of lighting we're doing for our characters? Yeah, so first up, I think Kat and I both decide we're gonna do just whatever comes to our mind first. So that could be doing lighting from above, um, from underneath, from the side, changing color schemes, uh, and how that affects the character and all that stuff. So we're just gonna see what happens. Uh, I don't really have any particular <laughs> plans for mine. Uh, <laughs> but I am excited to see what, what happens. But I do want to fix this gear real quick. It's bothering me. <laughs> yeah, who's your character though? Who, tell me about this individual. Okay, so this character is named Fran. She is a duo with Vince, who I did for our last draw along together with Jordan. And she's a main character in my antique store comic story that I'm making. Ooh, yeah, I'm okay. super excited. She, I actually like based her off of my niece because one time I like met my niece and she was wearing her private school uniform or whatever. And I was like, hey, that's actually pretty cool. I can use that as a design. That's awesome. We have oh, a comment from Maria that says, we're starting with a character from Kat who looks like she just found out a great secret. <laughs> yeah, Fran is a little mischievous. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit more about your character, Jordan. Uh, so like Kat, I also have a character that's connected to the one I did last week. Um, that one was Javen. This is Kayla, and she is part of my Shadow Boxers project. Um, but I don't get to draw her that often. So I was looking at it, I was like, you know, I need to do some more cool poses with her. So yeah, that's that's what we're doing. And so she's basically riding her uh, her hoverboard in a cool action-y way, like she's about to go into some battle or something like that. So yeah. Mm, cool. So since we're, I know we're just starting with picking out um, like flat colors and stuff like that, but do you know what you would want to do for the first um, lighting scenario? Oh, okay. So I have two versions of Fran here, as you can see. I just wanted to have the left one to show people like this is Fran, introduce her a little bit, but I want to color the right one in different lighting schemes. So this is sort of her being surprised. But depending on the light, she could look um, shocked or angry, or maybe it's an unpleasant surprise, or maybe it's a pleasant surprise. So I think I'll start out with the pleasant surprise. I'm thinking maybe something at like golden hour, sunset, or maybe sunrise or something like that. And that'll be really orangey, really bright, very saturated colors. So I think I'll start out with that when I get there. I'm still, I'm still debating what I want to do for mine because uh, since she's kind of flying, I, I'm thinking of doing some lighting from underneath. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, whatever I do, I think it's going to be fun though. Mm. Oh, comment from Maria. Jordan's looks like the type of kid who says, I'll try the skating movement until I get it right, no matter how many times she falls. That's true. She would be that type of person. She's determined, very fierce. Um, also very fun, though. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I actually like doing this one. I based her pose off of a, a figure skater, and that was a lot of fun. Oh, uh, nice. Getting, out, getting that gesture. It took me a long time to get the, the anatomy right, though. <laughs> so it was a little <laughs> bit in the neck, but <laughs> I think it... Oh, my gosh. It, yeah, it's kids are so hard to draw. They're especially, like the different age ranges of kids because they kind of grow pretty dramatically during elementary school to like middle school. And then, you know, once they hit teen years, they start looking, you know, properly human. <laughs> properly human, huh? 
But yeah. when they're baby to maybe 13 years old, they just like look partially human because the proportions are so weird for kids. <laughs> I don't think I ever thought they didn't look human. I just, I find it funny when things are just off balance. Like I knew, I know this one kid who was like six, three by the time he was 13, but his voice hadn't dropped yet. And he had like a, ba he had still a baby fat. It's so <laughs> he just yeah. had all lanky kid with a baby face. It was just really funny. He's grown out of it now. He's got a mustache and everything, but still. <laughs> <laughs> WC's asking, ooh, which figure skater, Jordan? I have no idea. Um, let's look him up. Uh, I found this one on Pinterest. I have the I have the thing open, but I have no idea. I, you know what? I'll put it in the Discord chat after the stream. We'll do it like that because I legitimately have no idea who he is. But he had a really great dynamic pose, and I was like, I need to do this, and it was so much fun. <laughs> I need to work more on action poses. Anymore. I remember when I was designing Fran and Vince, um, it was really difficult for me to draw Vince consistently because Vince is a short boy and I'm a tall person. So I sort of inevitably draw everyone too tall. Like their arms are too long, the legs are too long. And, you know, Vince, start, Vince was always looking really weird <laughs> to me. But I think Fran is a lot easier to draw because she's a tall kid. <laughs> so how do you adjust for the proportions? Like, do you, do you use like the eight head cannon, like the typical thing? Or do you just say, I want this character to have a huge head and like weird body or inhuman body or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> uh, honestly, I guesstimate it because after you draw a bunch of people for a while, you start to get a handle of proportion and how people are proportioned differently. So whenever I drew Vince and he looked too tall, I would be like, let's make him shorter. And you know what? Sometimes that requires me to redraw Vince entirely. And that frustrates me, that takes a lot of time, but it's easier to correct that mistake now while I'm drawing than when I'm inking, right? And I always reassure myself that, hey, I drew it once before, well, then I can draw it a second time again. I should not have to worry about erasing away what I did before, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. For, for me, it's always like, I'm always afraid to start from scratch because of the time wasted. It's like if I have a deadline, if I have other things to do, that's always the big concern for me. Um, but I totally understand like wanting to, you know, that being the part of the process to improve and, and mm -hmm. grow, like it's so key. We have a question from Seven Angelic. Okay, silly question. How are your color filling areas? Because how are you color filling areas? Because I keep trying to do it, and instead I just end up making a brush mark rather than filling the area with color. Actually, Jordan, you explained to me how to do this technique. Do you want? Do you want to explain how? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, um, this layer right here, layer fourteen, if you guys can see, that's where my lines are. And what you do is you set it. You, you tap on the layer and you hit reference. And when you hit reference, basically that means every everything else will refer to that layer as like the master version. And so same thing when it comes to filling lines. So what I'm doing is with a line set master, I can take a color like, um, let's see, it's a color that I haven't done yet. Um, here, we'll do this pink here. And then you take uh, the color from the top right and you just drag it and place it inside of the place where you want it to fill. And I recommend doing that on a different layer to make sure you do that and you should be good to go. But that's the way that we are both tackling this. And this is like the fastest coloring process that I know of, um, whether it's Procreate or Photoshop. Sadly, Photoshop isn't that intuitive when it comes to this though. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I want to make things so much. Even Clip Studio Paint does something like this, but I don't know. I mean, I know Photoshop isn't technically a drawing program, but it is now. Like, let's face it, <laughs> it's. I uh, 
think with the Adobe CC Creative Cloud and the subscription-based way it is being run, it might add on that feature later. They they need to because it just it doesn't make sense to me. It's like mm. every, all these other drawing programs have it. They know for a fact how often it's used for drawing, um, and I, I just don't feel like there's an excuse. Like it shouldn't take me two or three times as long to color a character. It just it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, Adobe, what's your excuse? You're a big company. <laughs> yeah, what's the deal? Oh, Neil has a question. Uh, does Fran have two layered eyebrows? Two layered eyebrows? Um, no, they're just two lines to denote her eyebrows. <laughs> Do you see that? I just colored the inside brown. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, there are some things that, you know, you can just like kind of leave as a mystery in black and white, but then once you color them, things get kind of obvious. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there are definitely problems that need to be solved um, in black and white or with like a style change. Like um, I was trying to explain someone how to draw a different uh, style for a character. And I said, let's make my character, you know, Powerpuff Girl style. And I drew them and they had gloves. And if anyone knows anything about the Powerpuff Girls, their hands are just like ovals. And I was like, man, how am I going to get past this problem? <laughs> how are they going to have gloves? They have no hands. Like, you know, little stuff like that it becomes really challenging. Um, Amaris is as, is saying, Jordan, I'm working hard on becoming a traditional comic artist. Tip, advice? <laughs> Do you have advice I, for that, Jordan? I think you're the one to actually <laughs> answer all the comic stuff. Cat, Cat is the comics queen of uh of art. Pro. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Becoming a traditional comics artist. I think, you know, comics are so hard because you have, you're basically the director, you're the costume designer, you're the cameraman, you're everything in a comics artist. So I think to begin with traditional comic art, you should start out small. <laughs> so actually, Clara and I will do a comics curriculum sometime this month. And we will be doing some simple comic exercises that you can follow along with us. But I would suggest doing those exercises first. Like maybe make a single comic that's only four panels. See how that works out, right? Or make a comic, which we will do on Art Prof, about how to do something, like an instructional comic, like what IKEA publishes with their furniture, but do it better than IKEA because IKEA is not that clear. <laughs> but, <laughs> no shade. Yeah, no shade at all. <laughs> My advice is just start small. You're not going to be the next uh, what, who is a famous comics artist. Bill You're not going to be like the next Alison Bechtel like immediately, right? You have to start somewhere. Yeah, that I don't think I can come up with any better advice than that. <laughs> yeah, that's why I referred to you. I was like, yeah, I'm not even going to I'm just going to refer to Kat. <laughs> uh, Clara says, OMG, I love your character's backpack, Jordan. How did you come up with the outfits for your characters? Oh, thank you. Um, so this is um, this was a challenge, actually. So my, my idea, this is a hoverboard and um, that she's riding on. And the idea was that it would magnetically attach to her backpack and it would kind of shrink down. Um, here. Like it just shrinks down like this. Um, and the way I came up with the came up with the outfits, actually, I have some thumbnails here. A lot of it is just trial and error. Um, I thought about who the character was. I thought about the culture that I was taking from uh, for reference, and just what is it that this character would like? She's a twelve year old girl in this you know fantasy uh, environment, and you know she has a hoverboard and stuff. And so I just started putting it all together and saying, what would she like? And then what do I, what is it that I think looks really cool? Because ultimately I'm the director. I'm the one who's making these decisions for her. Um, and it took a lot of, a lot of effort. Like these aren't all the sketches I did for, I probably did three times as many that I, you guys just aren't seeing. Um, but that's what makes character design so fun, at least to me. Just mm -hmm. trial and error. <laughs> Caitlin says, hi, Jordan and Kat. 
good vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I appreciate the good vibes. I think I'm going so slow. Like I feel like I probably should have probably should have gotten to the lighting by now, but this character's too intricate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> it's like a race. I feel like you would win this race, but if, if there were one, but well, I don't think friend has as many moving parts as your character has. <laughs> <laughs> that's I guess so. Uh, that's fair. Oh, Neil asks, Kat, what inspired you to have Fran wear pants under a skirt? Thanks for asking, uh, Neil. I, as I said before, Fran's outfit was inspired by my niece. And I saw that my niece was wearing leggings underneath her skirt because it was a cold day. And I was like, hey, that actually makes her outfit more interesting. Because when you wear a uniform, you're going to wear the same uniform as everyone else. Now, what can you do to spruce it up? You can wear cool leggings. <laughs> I like that. I think that, that just for character design in general, that's a great tip. Just like, how can you spice it up? Like, how do you make it not look normal or like some something super typical, you know? Mm. Like that's a trap a lot of people run into, especially when they're first starting out. Clara says, Kat, do you usually base your characters on people you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're seeing that trope when I mentioned Vince was based on someone I knew in middle school and Fran's outfit was based on my niece. I tried to because people are interesting in this entire world full of millions and millions and millions of people. You met one person and I think that's such a blessing. And I think that if you make a character based off of that one person, your character will be special, right? Yeah. Almost done. <laughs> <laughs> like these are empty promises. We say we're almost done, but then we take still very long. <laughs> it's it's almost there to me. I'll I'll say that. Maybe not to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like the fastest way I know to color. Like, can you imagine doing this on Photoshop live on YouTube? How long that would take? <laughs> that would take very long, yes. Ugh. Maria Bell says, this might be a dumb question, no such thing, um, but I'm not an artist, please don't judge. What do you end up doing with these characters? Do you make them into comics, animate them, or are they just for practice? Um, so I, for myself, uh, this character started as a thesis project and I wanted, and I fell in love with it so much that I want to turn something much bigger, uh, specifically an animated project. Um, but when people create characters, they can, it could be any of those things. It just depends on the circumstances. I don't know, what about you, Kat? Yeah, I think it depends from person to person. Some people have a lot of fun just designing characters for the heck of it. They call them OCs, original characters. And they just incorporate these OCs into, I don't know, spin-off comics. Uh, they write, I don't know, fan fiction about it or something like that. Some people have fun with it. But I'm not that kind of person, to be honest. Whenever I design a character, it's always for a specific story, whether it's animation or if it's for comics. So for me, I have a purpose when I design characters, but not everyone is like that. Jordan, would you design a character differently if your characters were in a comic versus if they were in an animation? um yeah there, there might be very subtle differences um like with animation um there's a lot of focus on being precise and being very exact because typically either whether it's one person working by themselves or generally what's common is a team of people you need to have it be very very specific um but when it's a comic and it's just you working by yourself there are certain things you can skip so uh, or maybe not realize as fully. Um, it really just depends. Um, the, the, yeah. the one, yeah, the one, the one trick I think is just don't design in such a way where you'll hate doing it over and over and over again because that's what you're required to do. 
<laughs> good, good advice. <laughs> I think for me, when I design a character for animation, I try to make the design as simple as possible. So if I were to put, oops, if I were to put Fran in an animation, I would probably get rid of some of the details, like maybe the ribbing in her vest or something like that. But fundamentally, a lot of character design have liaisons with other character designs and other medias. So you just want a strong character with a strong story. And that's going to be common no matter if you're in a comic or an animation or a book. These all have some similar things. Oh, Seven Angelic says, okay, so the book reads in Cat's comic reads the tales of, but I can't make out the last word. Uh, it's a... I just wanted to put French in it, and it's Les Contes des Fées. It's just fairy tales. So cool, you just throw out some random French in the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can pretend like I know what she said. I have no clue. <laughs> Man, I say, like, it's great when you're in a job interview or you put in your resume, oh, fluent in French. Like, I can say that if I'm not in front of someone who is native French speaker. <laughs> but when I'm in front of a native French speaker, obviously like my level is very apparent. <laughs> you know what, it's a lot further than some people. And by some people, I mean me. So. Okay, I think after this book is colored, I can start doing lighting. It's gonna be a fun stage. Uh, yes. Almost there, almost there. I'm trying to go at like rapid fire <laughs> pace right now. Right. Um, oh, Prof Flu says, Kat, would you ever write a comic in French? Maybe one day. It's going to take me so long, though, because writing and reading in French takes me double the amount of time than if it were in English. So for convenience sake, I would probably just fall back on English. But I have tried doing little comics in French. It's like, you know, what's funny is that comic language in French is different from English. So for instance, if I wanted to put people in a crowded area and I wanted it to be chattery, right? In English, I would write blah, 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 right? B-L-A-H, blah, 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 blah. But in French, it would actually be blah without the H. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. I, th I feel like I've seen that um, sometimes my friend will text me and they speak in their native language is Spanish. And instead of ha ha, they'll put J-A-J-A-J-A. -A -A -A. And it yeah. took me a while figure out what that meant. I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh, I thought it was really cool. I figured it out, but it took me like 10 times. <laughs> it took me like 10 attempts to figure it out. Oh, Jordan, I have a quick procreate question. So I just selected this area and I actually want to move both a part of these two layers, both of these layers. Does that make sense? How would I do that? Ask me the question again, um, please. So do you see, I have this friend selected. But right now my line art and my colors are on so separate layers and I would prefer they were on separate layers. How would I just like move them together? Oh, oh, so um, swipe right on those layers so you'll keep them together. Uh, yeah, or the other way. And then go to both layers and then select tool, the arrow at the top. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you meant? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't think there would be a tool for that. <laughs> Procreate has like everything imaginable. It's so awesome. I'm just glad I was able to not embarrass myself with uh, and get that wrong. <laughs> Oh, John Murph says, Kat, would you ever consider writing a book, a novel or a novella? I've thought about it and it daunts me because 
my focus was always on writing plus drawing. And I understand that writing by itself without any visual storytelling is a different skill set. But it doesn't mean I can't try. So maybe one day, John Murph. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I would love to see that. That would be the coolest thing. I go to your book signing with a mask on and everything, and I'd be like, "Cat, can you do a cool drawing for me?" And just say like, "To my art pop buddy" or something. That's what. Oh, for you, Jordan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, finally done filling the colors in. Sheesh, that took me only 25 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get some shine in here. Okay, I'm going to do the sun, sunset, sunrise, and lighting. Hmm. Let's try this. So all this time I'm worrying about color now, I'm just like, now what? <laughs> now I gotta figure this out. <laughs> I was procrastinating this whole time. And I think I want to make some little trails that will follow her from the hoverboard. I think that'd be cool. Ooh. Yeah, that looks kind of cool. I like this. A little cool trip. Hmm. Usually sunset, sunrise colors are very orangey, very red. I'm trying to make it orangey and red. Oh, we have a comment from Lisa H. All comics in French need a cat. I feel all cats already know French. <laughs> oh, there are several um, cat related um, comics and animations I can think of that are in French, actually. The first one is The Rabbi's Cat, Richard Yurabin. It's very good. It's written by Johan Sfar, who is an iconic comics artist. Um, there's another one called A Cat in Paris. Uh, it's an animated film. It's good. It's very tropey. It's for little kids, but it's beautiful. I would recommend it just to see the art. And I can probably think of more. <laughs> What, what is very it's, it's like, oh, the bad guys are bad guys, you know, the gangsters do gangster stuff. <laughs> like, but it's very much for a child. <laughs> the gangsters do gangster stuff. That's funny. <laughs> the, it's like they meet at night in an abandoned lot and they have business relations and they shake hands and there's there's money involved, you know, it's classic. Oh, that's fun, actually. You, you know what yeah. I just thought? For the first time in years, the other day, did you ever have you heard of uh, Muzi or Muzzy? He's like a green monster that helped everyone learn different languages. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, the oh, only oh. monster I know who helps you learn languages is the Duolingo owl. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it came out. It, granted, it came out in the '80s. I think the late '80s or something. But it was like a show from Britain, I think. And they dubbed it in like every language imaginable so that you could like show it in class and help kids learn with these anime characters. But I hadn't thought of it in so long and it popped up the other day. And I was like, no way, this is like my childhood right here. I, I just it was really nostalgic to be honest. <laughs> Maybe someone in the chat knows what you're talking about. <laughs> Hopefully. 
I don't want to be alone here, guys. Just uh, don't let me embarrass myself. <laughs> Oh, Freshy91 says, my style as of late is pretty tight and realistic. I'd like to explore a looser, more abstracted approach. Any tips for practicing? I think one of the things that helped me loosen up was just doing figure drawings or observational drawings with a deadline. So I would do one observational drawing with two minutes deadline, another one five minutes, and then another one 10 minutes. So trying that out might actually help you loosen up a little more and maybe you'll find some techniques while drawing like that that will help inform looser drawing later. Jordan, do you have any more tips for how to make more loose abstracted approaches to drawing? Yeah, um, if, if you're feeling really stuck, then maybe try just spending time studying the artists who are you feel are loose and admire. Uh, I think that's always a great way to go whenever you feel like there's something about your current work that you aren't satisfied with. And there's so many, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of artists who have a unique take on the world. And so by studying them, I think that can really be a benefit to, uh, to you if you feel in that struggle. I've often thought about that actually, just wanting to um, study some different artists lately. Cause I'm like, yeah, I, I like, like, cause I like the way I draw, but sometimes I get a little bit bored. I want to try mm -hmm. something. So I think I might take that on myself. Louis is asking, what is Kat doing with the colors? There are so many things I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> the first one I did was here. I would alter either hue, saturation and brightness, which is the top um, option or I would alter color balance. So just experiment with those two, two options. You can change the colors a lot there. The other thing I'm doing is making a new layer and putting in a random color. Oh, this is a multiply layer. Make, I'll make it normal just to show you. So just putting in a normal color and then changing the layer settings to be like darken or multiply or something like that. And then that will also dramatically change the color. You know what's funny, Kat? I feel like we, when it comes to color, we do like almost the opposite order. Um, because, uh, wait, just some, because you were just putting all the colors, um, like starting off with the overlay and then filling in, right? Is that kind of how you're trying to approach it? Sorry, can you repeat that? Never mind. You know what? As I was asking the question, I realized, you know what, Jordan? Stop talking. Because <laughs> I. <laughs> I start saying nonsense, wasn't you? Know, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, Jordan. <laughs> Never mind. Just uh, we'll just skip this moment in, in life and forget about it. Uh, Orange <laughs> cat spirit. <laughs> Orange cat spirit says, "Cat and Jordan are so nice to each other when they get something wrong, <laughs> like me, that how I just did now. They'll just be like, oh, that didn't work.'" Me and my friends aren't like that. Um, they just say, "That didn't work, you idiot! Don't tell me what to do." <laughs> well, everyone has their own love language. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we I feel like we probably could be snarky if we wanted to. <laughs> uh, I don't know how well that would look on YouTube though. <laughs> I feel like naturally I'm more snarky, but I try to reel it back in when I'm live on the internet. <laughs> People are watching, so you gotta gotta hide. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Seven and Alex says, in my French class, we were taught by singing by a singing pineapple. An ananas. <laughs> a singing pineapple. Interesting. You know, one of the first things I learned in French was how to say SpongeBob, because when I was on a plane. Um, to France, the only thing they played was Bob Leponge, <laughs> SpongeBob. So that's oh. how I was learning <laughs> what that that's was in French. Gotcha. I'm so glad you translated. I was like, can't follow the story anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Immediately shut down. <laughs> yeah. It, basically, that's kind of what would happen to me. <laughs> like that. That that kind of reminds me of how I used to treat 
math and science in school. Just like, I don't get it. Brain shut off. <laughs> art mode and start doodling in sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember my last day in math class. That's exactly what I did because I only took half a semester. I decided to just leave early because I didn't need it for any colleges. And so all my friends are going over calculus and stuff. And I'm sitting there like literally drawing a stapler. And it was the best day ever. <laughs> I don't have to do any of this stuff anymore. Era says, I just bought a drawing tablet, but once I started, I don't know what to do. It's like I forgot how to draw. Any tips for beginners? Oh my gosh, yeah. I think you're just so used to the tactility of traditional mediums that when you find a digital medium and you just don't feel the same, you know, tactility, I guess you sort of shut down. But I think with every new medium, it's just practice is involved. And I would maybe go search up your favorite digital artists or something and see if they have tutorials or techniques, like maybe what me and Jordan are doing right now, and you can try to emulate those things because what I find most satisfying about digital art is the tricks such as what I'm doing right now with the light and the shadow and not necessarily the the use of the medium if that makes sense like handling the pen and the screen that's not necessarily my favorite thing yeah the biggest issues I've noticed when it comes to starting digital is just like Kat said just getting used to the tool that feeling of uh, the smoothness of the glass screen. Like if you're using an iPad, for example, that, that can be very slick and a bit uncomfortable for certain artists. Um, and conquering that by just putting in the hours and or maybe getting a screen protector that's kind of textured or something, um, those things really, really help. And in my opinion, whatever you can do that helps the process and makes you draw better is a good move. I have a feeling I'm only, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get to two or three versions this time. I might just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of just guessing where there would be shadow. I don't know if this looks like sunrise or sunset just now, just yet. I think I'll have to like edit it, edit it some more. Yeah. Oh, Blue Wolf Spirit says, Kat, so you're playing with the copy to find the color you want to later apply it to the first one. Yeah. I actually, oh my gosh, I did not. <laughs> As I was saying it, I was like, oh, what did I do? Okay, I did. So I saved an original version of the color, as you can see up above. And then I made a duplicate layer so I can alter this as much as I want and be like, it's okay if I mess up because I have the original colors here. This might end up being a poster. <laughs> I'm kind of liking where this is going. Yeah, there's like room for text and everything. <laughs> yeah. Put it with another character or two. This could actually look really cool. <laughs> that was not intentional. I, I literally, I told Kat this earlier, but um, usually Clara will ask us like what we're working on for the stream. And I was like, I'll figure something out. I didn't have any drawing like at all. And I was like, okay, this afternoon's coming up. I got to finish this. <laughs> so I <laughs> working on it so that we can color it today. Oside says, I love how Kat uses a complimentary color for shade. Thank you. I fall back on complimentary shades a lot. <laughs> but you know what? The reason why I fall back on them is because they work. Yeah, I love that trick. Either, you know, the warm light, cool shadow versus cool light, warm shadow, and then adding complimentary to it always, always makes it work. Mm -hmm. I remember one time um, in my class, uh, I had a ColorWorks class at RISD, and our teacher had us paint the uh, the canvas like a bright lime green, like Nickelodeon slime kind of lime green, and she made all of us put our hand 
in front of it just to see how the colors would vibrate. And because my skin is like a red, red, uh, reddish brown, it was like the exact complement to that color. And I started like feeling kind of sick because the vibration was so strong in my eyes. It was crazy. Mm. Maria says the dramatic lighting and pose from the moment the librarian catches you with an overdue book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if a librarian can catch you with an overdue book, right? Unless they're really paying attention to the titles they're carrying. <laughs> That's a lot uh, of books to keep in, keep track of. I guess it depends on your reputation. Yeah. You know, if you're known for that, I imagine that could be a problem. Uh, <laughs> They've got their eye on you. Yeah, basically. Man, I miss libraries a lot. I used to visit my local library a lot, and I still do because actually they're still open even with the pandemic. It's just a way bigger hassle and you can't go inside, obviously. I don't go in libraries as often as I should. I, I do, I'll be honest, I miss the RISD library because that thing, for those who don't know, it was like, it, it was. It used to be a bank back in the day, and they renovated it to make it a library. But it's gigantic, and all the architecture is so beautiful. And it's like, I feel like there's treasure buried underneath there somewhere. You know, it's just like that mm -hmm. fancy. Oh, actually, I've talked to Jordan about this previously, but I've actually been to like below the RISD library before, and because it was a bank, it's there's vaults in there, and it's actually very scary it's dark <laughs> and there are a lot of locked doors and a lot of doors that are very heavy duty and you can see the gears inside because you know it used to be a bank <laughs> i forgot you told me that yeah now see now i feel like i missed out on my education because of that. <laughs> no one tells you no one tells you the cool stuff that goes on in these places you know <laughs> Like, I remember actually when I was a kid and I saw the first Harry Potter movie and um, they were like, uh, don't don't go to the second corridor on the third floor, whatever they said. And to me, even though they, he warned them not to do that and he's like, you guys are gonna get hurt. I was like, that's the first place I wanna go check out. <laughs> like, why yeah. would you not tell us? Like, don't tell a group of 11 year olds to not go somewhere. Like, that's a dumb decision <laughs> in my opinion. Oh, but Jordan, it's such a helpful storytelling device, foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, but realistically, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I totally would have. I totally would discover Fluffy before Harry Potter had even heard of it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, side. Is it me or does anyone else wish the skateboard Jordan is making was real? I wish it was real. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. I. It took me so long to figure this thing out too, because like I said, it's supposed to shrink back down and figuring out the length of that and how long her legs were and how someone's supposed to ride a skateboard, that took me hours to figure out. I know it sounds kind of, you know, almost ridiculous <laughs> because, uh, you know, you're just seeing it here and it's like, oh, it makes sense. That took me forever, it was brutal. Being an artist is hard when you have to tell stories. You have to be like, oh, but I want to draw people, but I have to figure out how this skateboard works. Basically. That's basically <laughs> the whole challenge. I mean, it's it's a it's worth it. That's how I feel about art. I think it's totally worth it, you know, chasing your dreams and telling stories that you find are really cool. But you almost kind of have to be careful what you wish for in a way because there's a lot of quiet, lonely hours associated with it. And it can often be frustration, um, all that stuff. But, yeah, that's just my take. I don't have a different take. <laughs> I think next, um, I don't know, what is the mood here? I feel like she almost seems angry, but also on my iPad screen, it's a lot less red than what I see here um, that's being live streamed. <laughs> yeah. 
whatever. I will go for a gray, dark, backlit kind of lighting now. Ooh. Oh, that was kind of cool. I love playing around with the glow on, on all this stuff. It, for some reason, it's just, it's so satisfying to me to get that to work. <laughs> Amars oh. Joseph's cat, thank you for the idea for doing a how-to comic. Yeah, my pleasure. One of the number one things I did when starting comics classes was a how-to instructional comic. Um, and to like make it challenging, which is what we're also going to do in Art Prof later this month, is we're going to do a how-to comic with no keyboard symbols. So if you take a look at a computer keyboard, you see every single symbol there. You cannot use it in your comic. So no letters, no exclamation marks, no plus signs, none of that. What, what stories do you find that to be the most difficult to, to do? Everything's like, really difficult. <laughs> fair enough. I don't make comics. I'm learning this stuff for the first no. time. Yeah. Um, but there is a very beautiful comic. I think it's called Ocean of Love. Uh, and it's originally a Belgium comic, Belgian comic, I think. So it was called Ocean d'Amour. Um, ocean of love and there are no there's no text in that story it's beautifully illustrated people should go check it out um, the premise is it's like this really old couple wife husband husband is a fisher wife is you know classic housewife and uh, she, the man actually gets lost at sea and it's their journey to try to find each other again. And it tells both the, the perspective of the wife and the husband as they try to go find each other across the oceans. That's really romantic, actually. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's so different from the stories that I would come up with. Mine would be like, the hero fights the bad guy and the hero wins type of stuff. You know? <laughs> Oh my gosh, wait, Jordan, I feel like we've talked about talked about this before, but we resonate with really different stories as well. Like you grew up on Avatar The Last Airbender, and you're also really into Spider-Man, and it feels like a lot of these superhero stories, which, you know, they're wonderful, but like the stories I grew up on were like Studio Ghibli or American Dragon Jake Long, which is so <laughs> different. <laughs> I love the specificity of American Dragon Drake Long. That, that was great. <laughs> it was the only TV show I watched on TV. Oh, sorry. Neil has a question. How do you deal with the color differences across screens? Oh, that's such a good question. You can't because you can't <laughs> accommodate for every single screen, unfortunately. So you're just going to have to try your best and... Like if there's something majorly wrong with your screen, then that is a problem. But if you get something of a general monitor, like, you know, a classic Mac computer or a classic Windows computer, and if it looks okay on these very general displays that most people have, then you should be okay. I hope that answered the question. It's a pain in the neck, Neil. It's a pain. It <laughs> is. Straight up. I remember um, when I first got my Cintiq, I had to try all these different things for color correcting because I would be painting stuff on my Cintiq, which was way more saturated and than it, it was supposed to, or maybe it was too desaturated, I can't remember. But when I went in class and turned in my work, it looked completely different than what I was expecting. And it was always either too gray or too bright, and I'd always have to fix it, you know, when there's two minutes left in the class, or two minutes left to the classes starting. Oh my gosh, do you know what's a pain in the butt? Jordan is changing the files for the printer it is going to print on because each printer oh. prints color differently. Yo, that oh, that was that was like junior and senior year of RISD for me. <laughs> Printing stuff <laughs> and not knowing how it would turn out. That was the worst. Freaking hated that. <laughs> yeah. I eventually found out that the printer I usually use made things a little bit too yellow so whenever i printed i would make my image very purple so that when it printed it would look more normal normal yeah that's that's not right <laughs> they need to fix stuff <laughs> like that 
I almost wish every model was just the exact same, just to make it easier on all of us. Lisa H says, my skateboard was a wooden board with metal wheels. <laughs> you know what? So was mine. I remember my dad tried to show me how to ollie one time, and he he broke it, like, on his third try. <laughs> and uh, never learned how to ollie, but, you know, whatever. That's how life is. Certainly so says, Lisa H, oh, my ankle still remembers those metal wheels. I was flabbergasted when they finally made rubber wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like some... Traumatizing childhoods over here. <laughs> trying to see how this reflective light would work on her face. This is interesting. Emma says, whenever I'm drawing on Procreate at night, I always turn the night shift mode off because it makes the screen yellowish. That's a really good tip, Emma, actually. I don't do that. I should do that. <laughs> I, yeah, there are some people who have different modes. Like sometimes I, I have these glasses somewhere that's for like filtering blue light, but I don't wear them whenever I'm doing something with color. So even if, you know, if it's a painting or if I'm doing something like this, can't do it because it's going to mess with you too, too much. And that's not going to be good. You know, it's funny on in Art Prof, there is a video called, what was it? Uh, Tips for improving your portraits or something like, like that, or portraits, portrait mistakes, something like that. And one of the top things you shouldn't do is put a halo around your character like what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you doing it, Kat? What is the purpose? because I literally didn't plan for a background. <laughs> and one of the top tips in the portrait uh, creating video was you have to plan for the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think both of us failed on that account. Mine is literally a gradient sky and uh, you know, <laughs> it is what it is, you know? I think we could be forgiven though. <laughs> Our prop is asking, do you ever get tired of your characters because you work with them and draw with them so much? Uh, some, sometimes. I get tired when I can't figure out the right pose uh, or it's just taking me forever to draw. But I, these characters that I've been working on are still pretty new to me. So I don't think I could say I've gotten sick of them just yet. But I don't know. I don't know if I've ever gotten sick of a character before, to be honest. I just make characters that I enjoy writing about. I think it's just a question of like, do I like drawing? <laughs> that, that's the question, yeah. Yeah. It's more like what motivates me to draw my characters is a story behind the characters. Um, so that's what excites me about drawing characters. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I often get asked about like some like tips on character design. And the one thing that I realize most people don't consider is the actual character and character design. Like people are so focused on getting the visuals to look cool. Like, oh, they're gonna have a cape. They're gonna have um, this cool sword or whatever that they never, or not never, but very seldom will they figure out who they're drawing and just taking the couple hours or doing the research to figure that out it changed the entire game for me you know when i started figuring mm -hmm. that out my characters improved significantly mm
what's the lighting scenario you're gonna go for this one? Because this is a new one, right? Yeah, something dark and gloomy. That's that's all I have in mind. I'll figure it out <laughs> as I go. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I totally get the dark and gloomy thing. It's actually really fun, but also like really challenging because part of it is the story in mind, like what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like each one's you have, even though it's the same pose, you gotta come up with a completely different scenario. And some poses I think are better, um, better suited for that than others, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't have time to be picky. We're running out of time on this stream. <laughs> <laughs> It can always be a part two, and you know, it's not like anyone can stop you from working on it. <laughs> Cat of uh, Neil says, "Cat, could you make one under green lighting? Green lights tend to creep me out." Sure, I can do that next. Let me quickly give this one some semblance of lighting, and then I'll try that out. How about that? Okay, this one's kind of backlit, so I don't know. We're just we're just guessing here. <laughs> I have to get to the request. I have to do green lighting. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a challenging one. <laughs> Not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to just straight up go for green lighting. I'm just gonna make this one done. I'm gonna give it a background color, and I'm gonna just say this is done. Yeah. Our prof says, I will say I really do feel like I'm hanging out in the art studio with people like I used to in art school. Oh, I am glad you feel that way, Prof Flu. <laughs> I miss this day. Did, did you have a, a, a senior studio space in your, in your final year? I did, yeah. Um, so I would alternate between there and also my apartment. My apartment was very nice, senior year of RISD. It was just like a really nice location and I was very lucky. So I would often draw there or just go to studio. Do you have any like fun memories of things you guys would do in studio? I do have a fun memory. Actually, it's the first one I think of. So I shared um, the studio space with Julie Bambassett, which who you see occasionally on Art Prof streams. And <laughs> one time I was asking for a stapler to just staple a packet of homework, right? Just a bunch of papers together. And she just like grabs the papers out of my hand and takes a wall stapler and staples the paper to her desk. And I was like, that's a wall stapler. Why did you do that? And she's like, I don't know. I thought the table would block the staple so that the staple would staple the papers. Um, <laughs> I was like, this is why we don't study industrial design is because we don't have a lot of good 3D sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I love that. Those, those memories, those days, I, that's one of the big things I miss about art school is just being in that community. Um, mm -hmm. In my senior year, what, what we would do, there, there were always like a good six or seven of us in the same room at the same time you know most some people would go and work in their apartments or whatever but most of us were there and so we would always just blast like disney music <laughs> or like a very particular song like happy by pharrell or you know thrift shop by macklemore or whatever just whatever song and we would just have little parties in there mm. and usually i was the dj actually <laughs> like for some reason i got <laughs> being that but it was a lot of fun. I miss that a lot. Yeah, I think honestly, that's one of the biggest things you get out of art school 
it's weird to say, but it really is the friends you made along the way and the memories you make with them. <laughs> okay, green lighting for Neil. This is for you, Neil. <laughs> Um, I'm going to make the whole thing green. What a what? I'm going to make the whole thing green to see just like what I can do here. Oh, I see. I see. Art Prof says, I always liked working in the studios at art school because oftentimes I hung out with people I wasn't super close friends with, but who were fun to be in the studio with. Interesting. Yeah, actually, I have a lot of experiences of that, too. Like, I'm not necessarily friends with the people I've worked with, but they're super cool to hang out with um, and talk about with art. Talk about with about art. Talk with about art. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Third try is the time. <laughs> I want I, I, you know what? This makes me want to have like some sort of like little art school reunion with everybody who I who I was in uh, the studio with. I feel like also maybe the pandemic is making you miss people and want to reconnect in general. Like I've had so many online reunions with like elementary school friends, middle school friends, and just like summer program friends I haven't talked to in years. And I think it's because of pandemic loneliness. Yeah, that that is true. I and, and Kat, you, you have quite a few uh, things going for you. You have pets and family. I live by myself. And so I don't see anybody ever. <laughs> and I'm always just like, let's let's zoom and do do art and stuff, or let's you know, do something. And it's always online and it can be very challenging. So I have talked to a lot of my friends from back in the days. Mm. It is what it is. So Tenley says, in my senior architecture design studio, the professor would come in around 8 p.m. and just hang with us, learn so much during those sessions, not always related to architecture. Yeah, I feel like when you're an artist, a lot of people are like, oh, you must live, breathe art all the time. That's why you have a studio is to talk about art and live in art and do all of that. But being an artist is also just like being a person. You have to hang out with people. You have to do all of these things to make you sane, right? So I think that was a really good choice of your professor, Soi Tanling, to just like be like, hey, I am the architecture professor, but I'm also a person. I'm just a person. And we can learn from each other in different ways, not just architecture. I think part, yeah, part of being an artist is not just the technical skills, it's about the experiences. Um, I actually was just reading an article the other day, maybe it was yesterday actually, and it was talking about a lot of these entertainment studios like, you know, Disney and uh, Nickelodeon and all these artists having to work from home. And a lot of them said that they wish they could go back to the studios because that's where they get their creative energy from, is from their coworkers and from the experiences that they have. And it can be very tough other, um, otherwise sometimes. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm liking the green lighting situation. <laughs> oh, it looks so cool. Wait, look how different this is from the orange one. Like this is the same Fran. It's just very different moods depending on the light. I love it. And light and color. I agree. With, I'm trying to think of what I'm reminded of. I feel like Invader Zim vibes. Like <laughs> if anyone knows Invader Zim, it's a very funny yet bizarre show from the early 2000s about an alien. Q 
Cat, pick a color for me. <laughs> uh, green. Any color. Green. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you heard it here, guys. I'm not being a copycat. She literally said green. <laughs> Neil says the green lighting looks like Fran unlocked a forbidden spell from the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this book story. was supposed to be uh, Greek myths. <laughs> Ooh. She looks like she's summoning something, says Emma. It really <laughs> does. Like, I actually don't know if I want to be around her if the lighting scenario were like that in real life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, please, please stay away. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be that friendly. Okay. Whenever you're working on something in color, excluding the streams because they're very random, do you ever um just try and plan everything out beforehand or do you are you willing to change the colors depending on the specific frame uh of the comic uh let me know if i got the question right the question right is just like are you will are you planning your color or are you spontaneous depending on yeah like how often do you want to be are, are you doing something that's spontaneous um like for example i remember in uh there's a scene in the Emperor's New Groove where Cusco's running from these jaguars or panthers or something. And out of nowhere, the scene just turns red. And it has nothing to do with the lighting, it's just the mood that's doing. So I was wondering if you ever did anything like that. Yeah, actually, when doing comics especially, when you put everything its local color, it's very boring to look at visually because things are being repeated. Like if I made Fran, in this color scheme for the entire comic, that's so boring. It's just everything's a fleshy tone, right? <laughs> a brown, a, a beige tone. But some panels I make red, some panels I color Fran entirely blue. I don't follow the color schemes as one would think to normally follow them. So I do try to be fun like that. <laughs> gotcha. So to answer your question, I try to be spontaneous. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, what I was going to do was if I wanted to reference a face being lit up from below, I was going to actually put my, like, <laughs> a flashlight underneath my face and look at myself to get the lighting right. Oh, man. See, this is why you guys should use reference. Like when I'm looking at myself <laughs> with the light, I'm like, oh, wow, the light hits my cheeks. It actually makes a shadow. Like my nose is casting a shadow. I'm going to include all of that right now. Yeah, there's always that tricky balance of light. Like, because like, sometimes when I'm working, I only think of the shadow. I never tend to think of the actual, like the tertiary or the third portion of the color, um, which would be the lighting. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... I'm trying to figure out what scenario she would be in where there's like heavy green lights. So what I'm seeing from the reference is that my nose was casting a shadow like that from because the light was shining from below. So my nose is casting a huge shadow I didn't even know about. <laughs> it's cool when you can discover new secrets like that. Mm -hmm.
to be honest. I'm not even sure what I'm doing right now. Everything. <laughs> I, this, is a huge, I have, this is a huge gamble. I don't even know if it's going to work or not. But, you know, uh, a lot of light and color and all of that, a lot of art is just spontaneity. <laughs> that is so true. Okay. Oh, and even the hair, man. Like, I see light going into my hair. See, I think that this light looks really weird, but somehow kind of believable and more unique than what I had done before. And that was because I used like a light reference. Everyone should use references. Oh, oh wait. I actually also, really like oh, I'm my sorry, top go ahead. I was going to say that my top lip was also in the light. So it looked like that. Yeah, I was going to say my favorite part is actually um, the area just underneath the eyebrows on both sides. That just <laughs> adds so much creepiness to it. And I love it. <laughs> I think it's also good to note that the light is coming from bottom right. So here, basically, um, and this sleeve isn't following it. So I'm going to make it follow it now. <laughs> she looks so scary. <laughs> <laughs> She's freaking out. I haven't actually seen the movie, but I think of Paranorman when I see that image. Oh, uh, uh, Paranorman. I remember that film. See, King, King of the Fall, being a self-taught artist, every time I struggle or think about how can I do that, our prof always seems to put just the right live show to help me out. It's almost like they're in my head. We are. We have invaded. We <laughs> Can't you see that's drawing? I mean, come on, it's it's telling. It's very telling of what we're doing over here. But, but we're glad we can help you out. There's like, I realized as I was drawing Fran that I didn't know how the lighting worked in her mouth. So I was like trying to see like, <laughs> referencing an open light, uh, sorry, an open mouth with a bottom lit light. <laughs> <laughs> and like my teeth are glowing, so I'm gonna make her teeth really bright. I feel like I feel like being an artist and getting references, you kind of have to be willing to make a fool of yourself sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. just look dumb every once in a while. Cool, I think I will just give it a background. I have no idea what scenario this girl is in right now. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> you know, I just got the really random, but I just got the sudden urge to watch Finding Nemo, <laughs> <laughs> for, specifically for the scene where Crush and Squirt are um, like talking to our, the main characters. Do you remember those guys? Is that the, those are the turtles, right? Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. I love their relationship. Just like him being like a Jeff Spicoli type of character. It's so much fun. <laughs> Oh, shoot. What did I do? Oh. Never mind. Hmm. 
three friends. <laughs> nice. Actually, don't you, I need to put mine all together and see how they look. I actually don't know how different I made them. I feel like if anything, this is the most bizarre of the three. I'm like really unhappy with this halo effect around all the friends, but I have no choice. I have to put all of them together. You can just make it more like a square. Maybe. I'll try that out. Swaitenly says, that is so true, King of the Fall. Just being part of this community keeps us inspired. Even the elements of art streams can push you to revisit your approach. Mm. So. You know, you know what actually is really cool, like being on different drawing streams with everybody, um, with you know you, Cat, Clara, and Deep Deep, and seeing how every how different everyone is and just the thought process. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any two that are really similar, and I know we're gonna start seeing Alex and, and Lauren pretty soon. I'm really excited for that. Oh, S says, can you guys turn on the setting so we can see your brush cursors? I didn't know that was a setting. Jordan, do you know about the setting? Uh, yeah. Um, it's uh, the wrench icon, preferences, and brush cursor. It should be the third one down. Whoa. OK, cool. <laughs> Wait, but it's still not appearing for me. Oh, wait, uh, I, I see it. I see yeah. it. Do you see it? Sorry. Some brushes are more difficult to see than others um, for various reasons. Like if it's too small or something. John Murph says, wow, Kat, I'm impressed with your work here. How do you know where the light is reflecting? Mm, thank you, John Murph. So for the green light specifically, I did a reference. So I lit up my own face. I don't know if you saw that part of the stream, but I was basically like, woo, scary story. <laughs> and referencing myself, I'm like, there's a mirror here looking at myself. So reference is my go-to answer. But another one is just, you know, sometimes you just have fun with it. Sometimes you just play around like what Jordan's doing right now. All of those bright neon lights. I don't know if Jordan can actually get very accurate references for those all the time. So he's just playing around. And sometimes you just find some really nice lighting situations that way. Yeah. Speaking of the neon light, that that's always going to be something that prevents or presents a problem because uh, most people don't wear glow in the dark clothing all the time or just colors that have this intensity. So that's something I always have to consider. Um, and especially such a saturated color, like this kind of magenta, um, it doesn't always work with every color scheme. Uh, and if it were a bright uh, scene, then you might not even see the glow much at all. So, yeah, figuring out the colors for these characters is incredibly challenging, actually. Feeling good. Oh, oh, we've got it just like a minute to wrap up here. Okay, let me see if I can combine these drawings real quick, just so I can say I did something. Uh, um, okay. Oh, dang it, I forgot the line art. Anyway, well, whatever. <laughs> It's too late. Well, let's see. So I did this, this, and oh, these actually came out pretty cool. Ooh. I think the gradient background is the right choice for your character, Jordan, because it seems like she's flying through some unnaturally lit landscape. You just can't see the landscape. You know the glow from cities? Yeah. Yeah, this actually came out pretty cool. I was nervous Oops. most of the time because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I think this one's my favorite, though. I like this one a lot. Is that the but, first one you did? 
No, this is the second one. But, uh, yeah. Which one's your favorite? Is it the green one? I'm assuming it's the green one. I think it has to be the green one. I mean, <laughs> I think it's uh, it's pretty cool, right? I like it a lot. I think it stands out the most to me. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah. But anyway, guys. Oh, wait, real quick. Vash, Vash the Stampede says, it's really nice to see them all together and see how the lighting affects the mood of the illustration. Yeah. Especially for you, Kat. Seeing all that together is so nice. I really like that. Thank Especially you. That, that green is just is stellar. But, um, Ooh, green. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, please join us in the Art Prop Discord and the Art Alongs channel right after the stream in a couple of minutes. The link is in the description below. Please subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel. And also we wanna say thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who have done so much to keep us going. We really, really appreciate it. And we love how this second page is just expanding every day. You guys are awesome. You're all rock stars. But uh, anyway, can't wait to see you guys art. Have a great night, everyone. Take care, peace.